Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with my vacation video. Well, it's not really a vacation. I was just taking a couple days off from making videos. And then, well, one of you very kindly sent me an email that said, I just want to see how you're doing. It's been such a long time since you posted a video. Well, this is Tuesday. The last video I posted was Sunday at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. And I thought, holy mackerel, if two days had passed and some people were already wondering and it seemed like such a long time, I'd better do a video. And you know, to be honest with you, two days passing without doing a video was weighing on my soul as well. I just wanted to do one because there's been a topic I've wanted to talk about. And I figured this topic would would actually create a conversation that would carry over until I'm done just, you know, recharging things and getting organized and doing the stuff I need to do. And I'm back on Monday. So so this will run on Wednesday. And so it's sort of in the middle of my 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 little week off. I, it just is, you know, I love you guys, and it's so much fun to do this. And I really wanted to do this talk. And the talk is the one emotion that no great music, no matter how great, can express. In fact, I don't think music can express it at all, actually, great or lousy. And it's really fascinating because music, we are taught to believe, and we do believe, at least as it, as it affects us, can express a huge range of feelings from giddy joy to happiness to pensiveness to irony to all the negative emotions. I mean, they're all in there and, and in every conceivable degree. But the one emotion that music cannot express, and this is one of the reasons I think we love music so much, is hatred. Music is about, fundamentally, it's about joy and it's about happiness, <laughs> and it's about goodness. It is never about hatred. And I, I really think that's kind of a fascinating thing. Think about it for a little bit as we, we move on and have this little discussion. And I'm going to try and prove it, or at least show how it cannot express hatred by showing you what happens when it tries to express hatred. Now, the effort in question is Ludwig Spohr's historical symphony, his symphony number no. six. Now, Spohr, who lived from like, what, 1784 to 19, uh, 18, pardon me, 1859, was possibly the worst symphonist of the entire Romantic period. He was enormously popular in his lifetime, and he was a really good guy. He spent his life he, trying to raise the status of musicians, trying to have music treated with dignity and respect. He invented the chin rest for the violin. He invented the baton for conducting. He invented score numbers for rehearsals. He was the head of the musical establishment in Kassel, Germany, for the last the 30 years of his life or so. And he was a, a staunch Democrat. He was anti-authoritarian. He was enormously gifted as a violinist. He wrote the definitive violin treatise of his age. I mean, he was really something and a talented guy, but he was a terrible composer in many, many respects. And the reason he was such a bad composer is exactly the same as the reason he was such a good person for the most part. It was that he believed that music should have always a dignity and refinement. And that dignity and refinement precluded any strong sense of feeling or passion or emotion. It really did. I mean, you can listen to his symphonies. They're all tame. They're all very tepid. Uh, you know, his, his rhythm is very slack. It's very limp and flaccid. And his harmony was always, he, he took his famous, his favorite composer, let's put it this way, was Mozart. And he took Mozart's occasional chromatic harmony and turned it into a system which destroyed the feeling of forward motion that classical tonality gave us without replacing it with anything else. And so his symphonies were, some of them were tremendously popular 
in the 19th century, especially the fourth, which has the pretentious subtitle, The Consecration of Tone. It's a programmatic work with a big, a horrible poem at the beginning about sound and the, the sacredness of sound and all of that stuff. I mean, it was it stayed popular in in the UK until the end of the 19th century, which tells you all you need to know about how uninteresting it truly must have been. And it really is, it, it, the music is just, it's nothing. It's just limp, limp and, and flavorless. And we have now two very fine Spohr cycles. There's one on Hyperion, and there's this one with Howard Griffiths on CPO, which I have permission to use. Um, with the NDR Radio Philharmonia, and it's a very, very good cycle. I mean, it makes as good a case for the music as you're going to make for it. So anyway, Spohr wrote a, a bunch of programmatic symphonies. He wrote a Four Seasons symphony. That was his ninth. His seventh was the sacred and the, and the profane and the spirit of mankind. I mean, just lofty stuff. And he was so incapable of lofty anything. I mean... He wrote some good music. He wrote some nice chamber music. He really did. You know, he wrote four lovely clarinet concertos. He, I, I do not want to turn this talk into a list of, well, I like spores, bleh. Anyone who writes 300 pieces, and he did, is, and who was as talented as he was, and he was, is bound to turn out an occasional nice thing. But by and large, his style and aesthetic was not conducive to the production of masterpieces. He thought that Beethoven was crude and terrible um, and that late Beethoven was completely nuts. He thought the Fifth Symphony was, you know, the opening of Beethoven's Fifth was lacking in the dignity necessary to the opening of a symphony. He thought the finale was just senseless noise. Nonetheless, he promoted Beethoven and he performed Beethoven because he was just a really good guy. But he despised despised contemporary music, the contemporary music of his day. Anything that was not descending from Mo the Mozartian standard of beauty as he saw it, he thought was just dreadful. And that included most French and Italian music of the period, especially theatrical music, because he thought that theatrical music should never sound theatrical. It shouldn't be noisy. It shouldn't be, you know, crude. It should, you know, all of this stuff. I mean, I, I don't have to go on. You, you see where we're going, right? He was effete. That is the word. He was effete, and his music is like a limp noodle for the most part. So that's where we start. The sixth symphony is called the historical symphony, or the historical symphony about the four major periods of music. And each movement is a pastiche in the style of one of those periods. And those periods are the what he calls the the Handel Bachisches period, or something like that. Let me see if I can actually get this. The the Bach Handel period. And then there's the Haydn Mozart chip period. And then there's the Beethoven chip period. And finally, the Aller Neueste period, 1840. And that's where the fun begins. But I want to play you a little bit leading up to the finale because I want you to get a sense of what his style was. Because none of these, these particular evocations of other periods are terribly convincing, but you can sort of figure out what they are, at least the first one you can. So the, it begins with Bach and Handel, and of course it's an overture with a fugal something, right? It's, it's even in this fugue, and the fugue gets going, you will notice the total lack of energy. And that lack of energy is caused by a couple of things. It's, called by, it's caused by ex an extremely four-square approach to rhythm. It's, it's produ <laughs> produced by orchestration, which is very blended, but somewhat monochrome and then almost never particularly interesting in terms of the, the play of timbres. It's caused by uh, the, the flaccid phrasing. I've used that word before, and it may come up again. Anyway, one thing he notices about Baroque music is that it has trills. That's how you know that this is Baroque. So let us listen to a minute or so of the opening movement of the historical symphony, number six, by Ludwig Spohr, the Bach and Handelsche period, or whatever it's called, the Baroque.
Sounds to me like the Baroque was a pretty dull period as far as sport was concerned, but there you go, and you know which one it is. Now, next is the slow movement, and the slow movement is the Mozart period. Haydn and Mozart, he didn't really care about Haydn. Haydn was frivolous. You know, frivolous. Mozart was, was, had the serious, elevated taste that Spohr tried to impose on the musical universe. So the Mozart period is a larghetto, and this is supposed to sound like Mozart. I don't think it sounds anything like Mozart. And since Mozart was Spohr's favorite composer and a lot of what he wrote was imitated, updated Mozart, he really wasn't working very hard to try and capture the spirit of Mozart because he felt that he was the spirit of Mozart. So here is the opening of the Mozart period. I mean, okay, it's pretty. It's a little rhythmically monotonous, but it's nice. It's all right. The scherzo is Beethoven, Beethoven's. And what makes this so marvelous is that Spohr didn't even like Beethoven. He really didn't. So how well do you think and how seriously do you think he would be able to imitate Beethoven? He writes a little scherzo. It does have like a little solo timpani at the beginning, quietly though. Not loud, because nothing should be eruptive. He didn't want anything in his music to be startling or, 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 or you know, obstreperous or, or sudden, which, of course, is exactly what Beethoven scherzos all are, right? He did throw in a couple little rhythmic, tricky things here. But by and large, like everything else we've heard so far, the music just flows along and it's slightly plodding, rhythmically stiff and unimaginatively phrased, you know, format. And so here is the Beethoven scherzo.
there, right? Just like Beethoven, right? Impossible to tell apart. Okay, now we get to the juice, the finale. Now, as much as Spohr, you know, may not have liked late Beethoven anyway, I mean, he respected Beethoven, and he, like I said, he performed him, and he did, you know, the first two periods he thought were marvelous. This was his idea to try and and pay homage to these three previous periods with varying degrees of unsuccess, in my view. But the finale, ah, the finale. This was his revenge movement because he traveled around and he, he knew more than anybody what was popular, what was being played, who was being performed. And of course, it drove him crazy because he was a German nationalist. He did do Wagner's Flying Dutchman in Tannhäuser. He promoted Wagner. And so, you, you know, we, we know he did not like Italian music. He did not like French music. And so to represent 1940, he wanted to write a parody of the style of music current in 1940 and to express thereby his dislike of it. In other words, hatred, dislike. <laughs> he was going to write some piece of of 1940s typical music that he thought would be just awful. And that's what the finale is. But here's the problem. Here is the aesthetic conundrum that I wanted to bring out. The problem with trying to express hatred in music is this. You can be ironic. You can be mocking. You can make fun of things. But you do it from a positive place in your life. You know, you may be witty or sardonic or whatever, but in order for the mockery to be successful, you have to write good music. It has to be good music as music. And for that reason, it has to come from a place of talent, of love, of positivity, of, of creative fervor, all of those positive qualities in order for the music to be great music, to be successful music. If you want to write something which is negative, which expresses your distaste for something, you're going to write bad music. It won't be successful. And boy, is this not successful. It's a piece of crap. It's horrible. It is a terribly conceived, just, it's not even obnoxious because, you know, Spohr would never be obnoxious. Remember, this is a guy who was, would never stoop to being, to being obviously sardonically mean and nasty and he wouldn't he wouldn't use the full capability or debase his talent in order to be disgusting or to diss something like that so what do we get what we get is just a piece of 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 namby pamby unconvincing junk so i'm going to play you the opening of the finale now here he uses the whole apparatus of Italian and French opera of the day. He brings in the percussion, snare drum, bass drum, cymbals, the mindless repetition, the endless change of, chains of dominant seventh chords that are supposed to sound dramatic. It's just, it's hopeless. It's absolutely hopeless. It's so unconvincing. But here it is. You ready? Now, just so that you understand how lame that is, 
I mean, because you have to know what the style is that he's imitating, right? The style that he's imitating is that of bel canto Italian opera and French grand opera and, you know, that whole tradition and people like Aubert and whatnot, and particularly the Aubert, I think, of La Muette de Portici, also known as Massaniello, the mute girl from Portici, which is a big grand opera that ends with a volcano erupting and everybody getting killed. Oh, it's, it's fabulous. It's really a wonderful opera, by the way. But it begins with an overture that sounds strikingly similar in some respects to what Spohr just wrote. So I want to play you the opening of La Muette de Portici. Here it is on Naxos with the Moravian Philharmonic under Dario Salvi as part of their five volume so far set of all of the Aubert overtures. And here is the opening. <laughs> Now, what is the difference between that and Spohr? The difference can be summed up, I think, pretty straightforwardly. Aubert is far more contrasted. It's loud than soft, which makes it more theatrical. It's more dramatic. It's more dynamic. The rhythms are stronger and more strikingly contrasted. The the, the pauses are pregnant and full of anticipation. Spohr would never write a pause. He would never do that. He would never interrupt the, interrupt the tepid onward flow that he was setting up. And more to the point, Aubert was a fabulous melodist. There's a gorgeous tune right there at the beginning of this overture. It's absolutely lovely. And he saw nothing wrong with putting a gorgeous tune in the middle of a theatrical overture. Spohr doesn't bother. He's not interested in writing his greatest melodies and putting them into this finale in this style. He's not writing great music in this style. He doesn't think there can be great music in this style. So what effort is he going to put forth to make it great? And the result then, does, it, does his movement tell us that ooh, this period was one of degraded, terrible music? No. All it tells us is that Spohr wrote degraded and terrible music to represent the period. It says nothing about the masterpieces that composers around him were turning out, those who knew how to use that style appropriately, accurately, profoundly. Right? I really think so. So the historical symphony was a tremendous failure, actually, in Spohr's life to everybody else's credit. You know, Spohr was enormously popular and very, very highly respected. But even in England, when they heard it, everyone just said, ugh, it sucks, it's lousy, particularly that last movement, because all he could do to express his distaste was write bad music which doesn't express anything at all other than its own poverty of invention. And therefore, my conclusion, QED, is that great music cannot express hatred and remain great music. It only sounds like bad music and it doesn't express anything at all. And uh, that makes me feel very good about my love of music and our love of music and what we get from it. Because it is never, 
a successful piece of music is never going to be written from that that position of of degradation it can't be it can't do it and be great music it has to come from passion love conviction sincerity honesty no matter how grotesque the subject matter no matter how sick salome is no matter how crazy the circumstance that fundamental honesty and and sincerity has to be there at all times or else it's just going to be bad music and bad music we don't care about and that i think is the position i'm taking and i'm sticking with it and i I hope this gives us sort of a little a little meat to discuss until I come back in a couple days with more new stuff. So keep on listening, friends. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you all for your very, very kind messages. When I announced I was going to take a week off, I, I really, really appreciate it. I'm very deeply, deeply touched. I really am. Um, it makes me feel good about not just music, but all of the people who are listening to it with me. Um, what a great group we are. I got to say, we really are. I think it's wonderful. Absolutely wonderful. So take care and see you in a few days.